Welcome to the Inner Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm Paul Ryan. Have you ever wondered about the traits of very successful CEOs of eight-figure business owners? What are their traits? What are their characteristics? What makes them different? Well, I've had the privilege to spend time with lots of very successful CEOs, both in mastermind groups and in forums that I've been involved in over the past many years. I've noticed seven traits that stand out among all these very successful individuals. Now, these are not textbook traits and characteristics. These are what I've observed from people I've come to know very well. So they're simply my observations, what I have found in common among these people. I think some of them will surprise you, but hopefully you can learn a lot from all of them. The first quality I have seen among all of these entrepreneurs is humility. Now, that may be surprising because I know CEOs and successful people are often characterized and presented as these very confident, overconfident, arrogant individuals. Well, that hasn't been my experience. And thankfully, in the groups I've been involved with over the years, I got to know many of them very well and really got to understand what makes them tick. And humility certainly stands out as a character trait I've found among them all. Now, when I say humility and I say they're humble individuals, I don't mean that they're not confident. I don't mean that they're not aware and that they don't acknowledge the success they have, the achievements they've made. They do. But I think the humility comes from two things. First is the realization that they have been very fortunate, that things have gone well for them. And I say that because almost all your success will come down to the things you do consistently well. And that will determine how successful you will be over the long term in your life and in your business. But also, people can be helped along by the winds of good fortune. And businesses and individuals can be destroyed by bad fortune. So the successful people I know are always humbled by the fact that they have been fortunate. They faced lots of challenges, but they've been able to overcome them and they've been fortunate. The second reason you'll find humility is because they look around and they realize they could not have got there by themselves. They have a team around them. They may have friends, a spouse who supported them hugely, but they look around and realize that a group of people enabled them to get where they were. And there is no very successful person that will tell you, I did it all, I got here by myself. At least I have never met someone who has been sustainably successful over the long time, who hasn't realized that it took a number of people to get them there. Now, the wonderful thing about that realization is when you realize that it took a number of people to get me here, you realize that's because I have a certain set of skills but there's also things I'm unskilled in. There's talents I don't have. And they have the humility to realize I'm not good at this. And they find someone to delegate that skill to. But because of their humility, when they delegate it to someone, they're willing to acknowledge that person's success and achievement. So when they achieve something, when they become successful in business or personally, they will readily point to the person who helped them, who they delegated some of the responsibility to, who walked the road with them. And when you acknowledge people in that way, they become very supportive of you. They become loyal because they realize that you recognize their strengths and that you acknowledge them. Now that works its way down through the company culture in a really positive way. Because when a CEO surrounds himself with a management team who he trusts, who he's willing to delegate to, who he recognizes often have skills that he doesn't possess. So he sits with them that way as equals, recognizing that he has a set of skills or she has a set of skills. And he recognizes that his team are equally skilled in their areas. But what happens when a CEO engages with his team in that manner, then he's training the team to engage with their team in that manner. So you end up going right through a company of people who do what they're good at and are eager to support and help other people and you redevelop a very positive culture in the business. So that trait of humility, while it might sound initially that no, a CEO should be arrogant and overconfident, so that trait of humility and to be able to acknowledge and work with other people really leads to positive progress for a business and a CEO. The second trait I found in almost all of the CEOs is 
coachability. They are really coachable. And what I mean by coachable is that they come to learn. So when we sit in our forums or our masterminds, they sit around a table and they're not there to tell you how successful they are. They're not there to tell you all the things they know. They're there to listen. They're there to learn. And what we do is we go around the table and we discuss different challenges and problems and opportunities. And you'll find that when we're discussing the challenges of a particular CEO, there's no defensiveness. There's no ego. There's just an openness to hopefully learn something that he is doing wrong or that he can do better. And likewise, as it goes around the room, as we speak with other CEOs, they're all just open and engaging. How can I learn? How can I do better? And when you have that coachability, it means you're always willing to improve. And when you're always willing to improve and always looking to make things better, it really is a steady, consistent road to progress. The third trait I've noticed is taking 100% ownership. Now, when I say they take 100% ownership, I mean they take 100% ownership and responsibility for whatever challenges or opportunities they face in their business. This doesn't mean that they take blame or fault for everything that goes wrong. It simply means that they take responsibility for fixing you. So many things happen that are just outside of our control that just happen. And when situations occur to us, there's two ways you can respond to them. One is you can get into the victim blame mode and that really takes you nowhere. And the other is that you can accept 100% responsibility and go about creating solution. So accepting 100% responsibility means you are taking ownership and responsibility for fixing this, for finding the solution, for making it better. Many years ago, we implemented a rule in our company I called the 95% rule because at the time we had a culture where managers would come into the room and they would spend most of their time complaining about what was wrong. And I knew I really needed to change this in the business. So I implemented a new rule. When you would come to a meeting, if there was a problem, you had 5% of your allocated time to clearly articulate the problem. Now, 5% leaves very little time for whining and moaning and bitching and complaining. It really means you have to clearly articulate the problem. Once you've stated, now you have to present a solution. Now, 95% of the meeting comes in two stages. One is you presenting your solution. And secondly, is the rest of the team engaging with you and finding a great outcome. But what it means is that 95% of the energy of the team is focused on the solution. Otherwise, you get stuck in the problem. Now, before I implemented that, what I found is people would just get stuck into the complaining, moaning, whining about the problem. And the problem would then seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger and very little time working on the solution. The thing I've noticed with all these successful CEOs is that similarly, they identify a problem and they just don't give it emotional time. Here's the problem. Now I'm 100% responsible for solving this problem in my business or solving this problem in my life. And they dig into a solution mode. And that solution mode is a very powerful place to be. The why me? Why is this happening to me? Why is this going wrong? That victim mentality leads you to a powerless state of mind. And the how can I fix it? What's the solution? How do we get out of this? That how question of how you can resolve the situation and how you can make it better really shifts your entire energy into a much more powerful state of mind. And a successful CEO is really someone who has spent most of the time in a powerful state of mind and powerfully solving problems and coming up with solutions to the challenges they face. Number four is that all of these eight figure CEOs are action orientated. And so they're thinkers. When a problem occurs, they will sit down and they will think about it, but they will move very quickly to action because they realize that action does two things. One is action can fix a problem because you find a right solution and you go and fix it. But if action doesn't fix a problem, and if you're in a mindset of taking 100% responsibility, then action has moved you down the road. And you realize this isn't working, but what if I turn slightly to the left Would that work? And they try that. If that works, they have a success. If it doesn't, they pivot and they go somewhere else. But they realize that they have a solution to their problem, which they've thought of. And now 
to bring that solution to fruition requires action. And that action is not the destination. Action is part of the journey. That by taking that action, they will either find a solution or move closer. But if you want to run a successful business, sitting on your hands and not making a decision is one of the worst things you can do. You have to gather the information and make the best decision you can and move forward quickly, but be ready to change and adapt. So that's number four, the ability and the readiness to take action. Number five is kind of an unusual one that you probably won't have come across anywhere. I call it grateful and vigilant. So this occurred to me sitting in one of my mastermind groups one day, and this CEO who I knew very well was talking about a problem, a challenge he faced in his business. And I was watching him because this is a very successful guy, eight-figure business, employs maybe two or 300 people. And he's sitting here quite humbly talking about his business. And when we were finished our conversation and we'd all share our different points of view, I just shared something with the group. I shared that over the years sitting with this group, I had noticed two things. I'd noticed that all in the group were grateful and appreciative of the success they have. So they all sat in that room with a sense of gratitude that life had enabled them to have the degree of success they had. But partnered with that gratitude was a sense of vigilance. And that sense of vigilance really said, I'm really grateful for the life I have up to today. But I know that tomorrow is not promised. And if I want to make sure I continue that degree of success, then I have to be vigilant. I have to make sure I don't fall asleep at the wheel. I have to make sure I don't get lazy. And I have to make sure I don't stop doing all the things that made me successful. So while they're grateful and appreciative of the success they have, they're vigilant and they're careful to make sure that that success continues. I suppose what I'm saying is they're very grateful for the success, but they don't take it for granted. They don't take it for granted that that success will be there tomorrow. They don't get complacent. They don't sit on their laurels. They keep moving forward. They keep pushing forward, appreciative, but ever vigilant, ever watchful to make sure that they enjoy the success they have today, but they continue creating that success so they can continue to enjoy it long into the future. This, the sixth trait I have noticed among all the CEOs that I've had the pleasure to spend many years working with is that they genuinely care for the people that are working for them. It makes really good business sense to look after the people who work for you, who are important to your business, to look after them very, very well. So that just makes good business sense. But the trait I've noticed among these individuals is that they genuinely care for the welfare of the people working for them. They have that very profitable business because they have great people working for them, great people who take care of the business. But they value those people. They take care of those people and they are really concerned about the welfare of those people. And that concern, it's heartfelt, it's genuine, it's sincere. It pays them back tenfold. Now, that may surprise you because often business owners and CEOs are not seen in that light. But what I can tell you is the culture and the type of CEO, and these are eight-figure CEO business owners that I have been in forums with and in mastermind groups, they all really look after the people who were on their teams. Seventh and final trade is one I call hungry, but not starving. What I mean is that nobody becomes successful in anything to any level without a degree of hunger. In fact, the degree of success you've achieved in your life is probably exactly correlated to the degree of hunger you have. You have to have hunger. You have to have drive. And when you sit in a room of very successful eight-figure CEOs, you will find they are all hungry. They're all hungry to grow and drive their lives and their business. But there's a distinction between hunger and what I call starving. Hunger is a natural drive, and we all have it to some degree. And very successful people certainly have it more than others. And it keeps them striving and it keeps them moving forward. But if you want happiness and if you want fulfillment in your life, you have to taper that hunger with some degree of sitting back and enjoying the life you can live as a result of what you can achieve. But a certain element of CEOs, and they're probably the CEOs who go way beyond the eight-figure business, 
who build nine and 10 figure businesses, the billionaires. I haven't got to know many of them. Most of my experience has been with eight figure CEOs, but some people are beyond hungry. They are starving. I'm talking of the Elon Musks of this world. These are people who can never have enough, who can never build enough. There is no point where they've built their business to a point where they go, this is it. I'm very successful. I've built a great business. They never reach that point. They always have to keep growing and growing and growing. There is no fulfillment. They're striving continually. It's a very interesting podcast called Founders, if you get a chance to listen to it. And this guy studies all of the very successful people right through history. And the common trait among the really successful, I'm talking the billionaires, is that they have this nature of just never being fulfilled. They're always chasing for more. But you know, most of them don't end their lives very happy. They end up damaging relationships with children, with partners, with family. They don't take care of their health. They build an extraordinary level of wealth and achievement, but they're never fulfilled and they're never happy. And this is common among the extremely successful in almost all areas of life. So what I've noticed among the eight-figure CEOs I've mixed with, and most of them I would describe as balanced and happy individuals, they're hungry. They have the drive to get themselves the level of success so they can feel fulfilled, but they're not starving. They don't need to keep pushing to a point where they literally burn themselves out and destroy everything around them. So that's the distinction. I think everyone needs hunger. But you've got to be careful that that hunger doesn't become something that eats you instead of feeding you. So there are the seven traits that I have noticed among the eight-figure CEOs that I've had the pleasure to spend time with. These are just my personal experiences. These are what I have noticed. But I think there's some really interesting traits to be found there. And I also, I think there's some powerful lessons that we can learn from people who've already been really successful. This is the Inner Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm Paul Ryan. I hope you found lots of value in this episode. So please like, subscribe, comment, share with your friends. It all helps the show. Until next time, take care.